Rick Ferguson, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I was doing the broadcast countdown for you. I was like five, was, uh, and then you lost count. Well, welcome to the podcast, yeah. Rick. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we haven't talked about this, but in two thousand and who cares? It was like five, six years ago. I was just a little, a little baby in the uh, cybersecurity world, right? And uh, you were at a conference in Tromsø or Bulda, somewhere up in northern Norway. And I had no idea who anybody was, right? I didn't know who Ted Micro was. I didn't Ooh, know who you I were. I remember it. And you showed up. I remember And it. I just remember meeting you and being like, oh, this guy was really cool. And, you know, it was we had a great time. It was, it was a party, right? And the next morning, you walked up on stage as the, the keynote. And I just remember thinking to myself, holy shit, that guy was so nice to me. Why would he do that? And that was my first <laughs> time I ever met you, Mr. Ferguson. So thank you so much. Why would I not, why would I not do it? That's the, that's the funny thing. It's like, why would, I, why would I not? I was invited there to speak. Um, because the organizers, I guess, like the kind like of things, things that I speak about or the way that I speak about them or something, but yeah. that's all I was, but I was there just like anybody else. Why would I not, not be nice to someone who wanted to be it? Yeah. Right. Well, uh, I think that's super cool. So, uh, thank you so much for taking care of the young aspiring security, uh, professionals. <laughs> My pleasure. And now you're on the podcast. So that's great. So what, but like, what do you no, do in like a normal no. day? <laughs> like what's, what's Rick Ferguson's normal day? <laughs> It really isn't a normal day. And I've learned that it might be that I'm writing a script. It might be that I am doing research for more of an academic paper to be published. It might be that I'm in dialogue with colleagues on um, technological direction for Trend Micro products or even marketing. Um, it might be that I am in a meeting with law enforcement. Mm talking about setting priorities for um, where would be sensible areas to focus, where would, would we possibly get the greatest return on efforts when it comes to disrupting cybercrime. Mm. Um, but there are so many different areas to the job um, that yeah, there really isn't a normal. And, and I've <clears> discovered <throat> because of COVID that that's, that's because of the job, not because of the travel. And I love it. It's great. Mm. Well, it sounds, uh, sounds super fun. It sounds like the mission is just trying to, uh, basically trying to get security awareness out there, right? Literally right next to me here, if I just go here, that this is the kind of thing, right? So we just finished, um, well, actually back in December of 2020, uh, myself and my co-author, Vic Baines, we finished writing uh, a report called Project 2030, which mm. was trying to anticipate the, the next 10 years of technology and society and change and what opportunities that might mean for cyber criminals, right? Mm. That was, we finished writing that in December. It was published at RSA this year and we had did a speaking slot there. And after it was published, we started creating a nine episode web series. Mm. Um, all of that's quite a lot of work. So 2020, a typical day would have involved stuff around the white paper. 2021, it's things like, so this is just happened to be sitting next to me. This is the script for the web series. So it might be literally, writing script, writing dialogue, which is not the kind of thing you would expect to see in, in a cybersecurity role. Wow. Um, so wait, you wrote the script so and, and you, you helped out with the camera angles and stuff, or is that something like some sort of video? So we, as, a, as a team, you know, we, we I, the camera angles and stuff, that's the director. That's, I mean, that's his expertise, that's his mm. area of study, and he's brilliant at it. Um, but the the conception of what, what story are we going to tell? Um, because Project 2030 itself is an academic white paper, right? Where we talk about how do we baseline where we are now? Mm. What are the major dri <clears throat> drivers and accelerators of change? And then we write three scenarios. What does 2030 look like for an individual? What does it look like for a manufacturing organization? And what does it look like for a government? And then we, mm. we kind of color those scenarios and, and extrapolate out. So what are the implications for cybersecurity stakeholders? Where should mm. you be focusing now? try and get prepared for the future. So that was a very academic exercise. Um, what we wanted to do with the web series is bring it to a wider audience because within cybersecurity, we're really good at talking to each other, right? We're, we're really good at, at, at having um, illuminating and educational conversations with our peers and colleagues within the industry. It's a, it's a very conversational industry, which is great, mm. but what we're not very good at is talking to people outside of our industry. We're not very good at bringing other people in. So we wanted to create this. Um, we've ended up making a, a movie. That's DBT. awesome. That's awesome. Um, and it's it, yeah. If anyone's interested in watching any of it, twenty thirty dot trendmicro dot com. It's all out there. All nine episodes are out there. Uh, you can binge it 
uh, and let me know what you think. Cool. So uh, there's none of this like uh, two people sitting, sharing a keyboard, typing in, and after 10 seconds, we're in. None of the typical. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, you know, we have to take a certain amount of what my mom always used to call poetic license um, with the storytelling because we are trying to describe mm. technologies that don't exist yet. Mm. Um, but it's based in solid academic research. And I'm definitely the kind of person that when I'm watching films like that or content around our industry, I'm definitely the kind of person who's like, but that wouldn't happen. And that happened too quickly. And that never happens. So mm. we definitely try to avoid those kinds of scenarios, like obvious, how did they do that? Mm, right. Obvious BS scenarios, right? But hey, those, this, um, the Project 30, 2030 pr uh, predictions. T tell us about some of those. Um, are there, I mean, there are so many. So the white paper itself is like 30 something, almost 40 pages long. Okay. Um, if we talk about the world for the individual, definitely sensors and wearables are playing a much greater role than they mm. do now. We talk about um, you know, sensors in your clothing, sensors in your children's clothing. One of the things mm. that I find really difficult right now, for example, is knowing when my daughter needs new shoes or not. Because trying to find her toe at the end of the shoe is actually uh, really difficult. So wouldn't it be great if the shoes told you, hey, by the way, these are too small now, you need to go up a size or whatever. That would be kind of cool. Mm. So sensors that tell you, you know, those kinds of things, m um, contact lenses that measure your uh, mm. lacrimal fluids, your tears, looking for, for evidence of medical conditions, patches that can do the same for sweat composition, looking for medical conditions. We even talk about a connected toilet bowl because I was thinking, you know, one of the worst things that, that you have to do right now is taking a stool sample to the doctors. When the doctor says, oh, I need a sample, you're like, oh, man, seriously, I have to go digging with a wooden spoon. And yeah, it's no, it's not a pleasant experience. Right? <laughs> so wouldn't it be, there's no reason why a toilet couldn't do that for you if it was constructed in such a way. So we talk about that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Watching some of the predictions come true or begin to come true or show signs of coming true has been fun because we did this with Project 2020 which we published back in 2013 mm. and we had seven years to watch these things begin to come true and it and it was a slow roll and it happened um with 2030s we've already seen some stuff begin to materialize and even believe it or not the connected toilet so we, we put it in and we published uh, the paper and not long ago i was you know, scrolling through doom scrolling twitter or something anyway uh, and i found this uh, university project of exactly that it was a connected toilet. It wasn't one that would actually chemically analyze uh, a your feces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it did have cameras pointing down the toilet bowl and lights. And so after you had finished, it would take a picture of, of your great <laughs> achievement and then compare it to a database of other great achievements and, uh, and let you know if there were any worrying signs. Oh, so we're wow. kind of already on that. So that's just one. Lots of sensors. Um, but lots of sensors also means lots of aggregation of data. So taking data from the home, from medical staff, from retail providers, nutrition providers, fitness providers, mm. medical, uh, aggregating all of that data and using some of it to influence things like behavioral change. Um, yeah, it might be that certain data will prompt medical inter interventions and uh, prescriptions, which, by the way, could be sent to your home drug printer and you could print your drugs at home mm. on receipt of a, of a, um, a verified prescription. Just for example, we also mm. talk about printing food at home, 4D print, uh, 3D printing of food at home, um, particularly, you know, with the climate crisis, uh, more people turning away from meat, although, you know, um, 3D printed meat is already a reality. So we're not mm. we're not inventing technologies, but we're saying uh, in, in some cases they will become much more widespread. Mm. Um so, so that, yeah, some of them might prompt physical interventions like that and prescriptions and, and medical interventions, but also behavioral change stuff like um, based on certain health conditions, maybe the alcohol will become invisible in your online shopping shelves or, mm. or high fat foods might no longer be available to you until the medical condition was at a reasonable level. And then you could uh, um, you know, change your diet again as required. Mm. So behavioral change stuff as well. Uh, we talk about the possibility for direct neural linking of humans. Think of Elon Musk's um, Neuralink project. 10 years from now, we say it will be beginning to progress beyond medical usage into recreational use. Um, you think about the length that some people will go to for a, a frame rate advantage in a first person shooter. Think of the advantage you would get from a direct neural link in that kind of scenario. So 
recreational gamers being the the early adopters of that kind of technology. Um, one that always gets people thinking um, when I talk about it, and to be honest, it's something that I was talking about before we'd even written this report, um, probably as far back as 2018, 19, something like that. Um, the potential for digital immortality, effectively. So a digital version of you that outlives you. Um, Shit. So imagine an AI, right? That, that, and, and the technology is pretty much there to achieve this right now. And you know, with 10 years worth of development, this is entirely feasible. But imagine an AI that has access to um, all of your social media content, all of your text messages, WhatsApp messages, um, your emails, uh, your interactions, your telephone calls, mm. has access to all of that. It can build up quite a picture of you. Maybe you even have a daily conversation with your AI mm. to tell it what you've been doing that day, how it made you feel, um, you know, what your beliefs are, what's challenged you today, all of these things, right? like, a, like a personal diary. So this AI has a wealth of information about who you are and what makes you tick, how you act, interact, and react with everything. And then when you die, it becomes you. Or maybe even while you're alive, it can act as your surrogate. Who knows? But it's, it's a version of you. When you die, it doesn't, effectively. Um, so we're talking about digital immortality. Mm. And, but increasingly, these digital versions of ourselves will be gaining agency, right? They will be able to in, engage in new experiences and interactions after you've died. And you won't be there to moderate the character of that AI anymore. You won't be providing input anymore. So it will continue to evolve. It may evolve in the way that you would have, or it may not. But you will be increasingly faced with scenarios of you know, grieving relatives looking for legal remedies to ensure that loved ones are not switched off. Um, or maybe mm. to ensure that they are as mm. digital humans begin to engage in antisocial behavior or even criminal behavior. Interesting. It will be an interesting ethical question. Um, we talk about changes to education because even now, but you know, ever more so, the total sum of all the world's knowledge is available at our fingertips already, right? And look what we do with it right now. <laughs> so we're saying education will change necessarily because historically education is about retention of data right it's about being presented with a bunch of facts and remembering them that's you know if i put education it's certainly my education in a nutshell uh, it's you know remember all the kings and queens of england that kind of stuff which back when you didn't have instant access to that kind of knowledge that some of that was probably helpful you know i can still remember pythagoras's theorem but I don't need to because I can go and find it really easily if I don't remember it. That's why none of us remember phone numbers anymore. But when I was a kid, I had a whole phone book in my head. But now I don't need to. So my brain does other things, which mm. is perfectly sensible. That's, that's exactly what should happen. Mm. But education needs to change. So it needs to not focus on um, the retention of knowledge because we have other things to retain knowledge for us but on the processing of information. And it's contextualization a far more maybe, yeah? nuanced mm. skill. So you have access. Just think about the conspiracy theorists of today. You can believe all kinds of wacky stuff, right? Totally up to you. Uh, but there is a propensity to believe more wacky stuff if you're not very good at processing the facts and recognizing the facts as they stand. Mm. So an education that focuses more on giving us that critical thinking ability um, is extremely valuable in being able to combat things like uh, fake news, alternative facts, conspiracy theories, and mm. all the other things that go along with that. So we, we speak about educational changes as well. Um, but there's other things. There's a factory. So we, we have our, our manufacturer in 2030 is um, a 200 year old company that um, started off in rubber manufacture. During the great pandemic of 2020, they retooled their production <laughs> lines and they started making medical equipment, uh, which brought them into the healthcare supply chain. Um, we talk about, uh, so that, that actually, they fall into an, a new and developing categorization of critical national infrastructure supply chain. Because right now we talk about protecting CNI, but mm. longer term we have to think about how do we protect the supply chain for CNI as well, uh, as more and more attacks focus on the supply chain, right? Mm. Um, they, everything is connected, everything is automated, so their manufacturing environment is all 5G connected. Ten years from now, we'll be talking about the introduction of 6G. So 5G is an absolutely everyday 
uh, technology in a decade's time. Mm. Um, they have a digital twin infrastructure in the cloud and all of their production line is 5G connected. So everything on the, on the manufacturing side is feeding real-time intelligence and data to the digital twin uh, cloud version of the production environment. So that's real-time asset condition uh, information, hazard monitoring, uh, configuration, um, date, you know, real, real-time data. So your digital twin is an exact and accurate replica of your physical environment. So things like preventative maintenance become much more effective. Uh, and much more cost effective mm. and also testing changes to configurations you can do that in your in your fully up-to-date digital twin you know is my manufacturing hardware capable of implementing the change that i want to make or do i need to replace some stuff because it's wearing out you test it in your digital cloud uh, in your digital twin uh, so um, that kind of technology and one of the other areas actually that plays quite a significant role in the web series um, is the concept of 4D printing. And when I mentioned that to somebody recently, they went, what, they're printing time? Um, no, <laughs> they're not printing time. So That's 4D cool. printing is not about printing time. They were joking when they said that, I should point out in case they see this and go, Rick, you're totally misquoting me. Um, 4D printing for us in the terms of the, the document is about the, the creation of manufactured goods that will change form depending on external stimulus. So imagine if you're making something, if you're in rubber, then making self-healing rubber, which is one of their new products. Uh, may, you, maybe you'll be making stuff for cables at the bottom of the ocean, extremely mm. useful, or maybe you'll be making stuff for um, satellites at the edge of the atmosphere, right? Your, your operating environments are that diverse. But if you are making something that needs to go up to space, it's in your interest to get that as small as possible, get it as mm. flat packed as possible. Think ikea manufacturing right um and then when it gets to where it needs to be depending on external stimulus like gps like bluetooth like wireless whatever um this flat packed item assembles itself into the thing that it's supposed to be where it, where it needs to be so on a bigger scale like that or even on a small scale imagine a heart stent um you know the thing that you put in your artery to keep your arteries open um right now that requires surgery to have a heart stent right Imagine if you could have one that was kind of flat packed and you could deliver it via a syringe. And mm. when it gets to the right place, external stimulus means it just opens out into the heart stent that it's supposed to be. Mm. Um, so that's that's 4D <laughs> printing. We talk about that from a awesome. manufacturing perspective. And then the final scenario is government, nation state. Um, there are lots of popular concerns about um, data aggregation from by citizens. Um, concerns from citizens, not aggregation by citizens. Mm. Uh, the government is grappling with the notion of a single digital identity, whether that would be a good thing and the popular resistance to, uh, to that. Um, big concerns about foreign influence operations. You know, we already see that today with you know, what in, in retrospect will look like very rudimentary social networking influence operations, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Um, if you imagine a fully immersive world where you are totally used to interacting with um, AI generated video versions of people you know, uh, of film stars, of politicians. Imagine how an influence operation would look in that, uh, in that scenario. It would be a fully immersive conversational uh, experience, much more visceral, much more likely to succeed on a social engineering level. Um, mm. Because, you know, in a world where your favorite movie star doesn't have to appear in a movie anymore. They just license out their, their likeness and their voice, and they can be in seven, you know, working on seven different films at the same time without mm. ever acting. Uh, your politicians might not have to appear in person because they can appear as their avatar. Um, it's a world of synthetic influences where people who are out there commercially um, trying to change your, your opinion or your worldview don't even map to real offline humans. They, you know, they don't even exist in our world. They only exist in the digital world. Mm. Um, so influence operations and sure. by foreign foreign states will be much more concerning in, in that kind of world. There's loads. I mean, I could go on for hours. There, I mean, there's, there are so many. Those, those are just some of the of the predictions in the document. Yeah, but those are that's really awesome. And like, my, my, I just went on like a mind travel thing. That, but all those things you said, they, <laughs> they are they are real. That's going to come all of them. Uh, and very soon. That, that's the thing. So what we're not trying to do in the document is to predict the future of one single real world nation. Um, but we, so we created a, a fictional state uh, of New Sanjaban 
where we could make all of our predictions come true at the same time. Yeah. Mm. So we're not saying that all of this will come true in all of the world mm. in, in exactly 2030 for everyone. That would be ridiculous. Mm. But if we put them, all of our predictions in one single fictional country, what it allows us to do is to identify interdependencies, linkages, points of acceleration, barriers to adoption between all those different things. And that's why we, we had it all come true in one place in the document. But you will also see, because that's the purpose of the document, what that means from a criminal perspective and what the threats of the future might look like. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned the word interdependencies earlier, all these crazy things that you're mentioning. Like, what are the, like, the biggest, or not interdependencies, what are the biggest risks, like um, collective risks, I guess, from a security perspective for all those things? Really, it, it all hinges on data. data. So for me, uh, it's, right. it's twofold, mm -hmm. right? The, First of all, data is is super important already. You know, there is a whole industry of data brokers mm. that sort of sprung up from the, the nutrient rich soil of each of our digital footprints. Um, and it it is a, an industry that is making vast amounts and increasingly vast amounts of money from our nonchalance and our ignorance. Um, we, you know, we we don't care about our data and we don't know how much it's worth and, and mm. the kind of income it can generate. Um, and that's what's enabled this business. So I don't see that nonchalance uh, about our data really changing that much mm. um, because most of us have already given our data away and people who have yet to give their data away will start doing so when they're very young because we're increasingly young when we're connected now. I wasn't connected per se until I was in my mid-20s because the internet wasn't really a commercial proposition until I was in my mid-20s. Mm. So I didn't start giving my data away until then. And of mm. course, I started immediately. But okay. now, you know, you've got kids with iPads um, whose parents willingly surrender their data and the kids who go on to willingly surrender their data. So I don't see that changing much. So part of it is definitely around data and how criminals can find ways to monetize data and find ways to access data. And you see that already with ransomware. So the primary um, model for ransomware was about denial of access to your own data, right? Mm. You, the, the, the threat actor would encrypt your stuff and say, give me some money and I'll give you your stuff back. And that was basically it. Mm. Um, as victims have become more used to this as a, as a threat scenario, then they're paying more attention to some of the basics of cybersecurity, particularly around best practices for backups. If you're following best practices for backups, you have offline backups as well as online ones. Um, unfortunately, that best practice kind of fell by the wayside with the advent of online backups because they were far more convenient and people went, okay, maybe I don't have to take the tapes home every Friday, which mm. is what used to happen. Um, but we're relearning that because if you've got offline backups, you can recover from a tragic ransomware incident. Um, so criminals are looking at how do they continue to monetize that model? And it is about the data. So mm. now, of course, still the primary threat is denial of access to your data. But now before they encrypt your data, they steal your data, then they encrypt it. Then they say, hey, if you want your data back, pay us money. And if you say, don't need you to give me my data back, I already have it. They say, so do I, and I'm gonna start publishing it unless mm. you give me money. That's so that's secondary that. encryption. Mm. On top of that, you know, triple extortion, they'll now start going through your data and, and threatening to contact your customers, your business partners, and so on, either to extort money directly from them or to let them know that they have your customer's data uh, because of your mistake, which, mm. of course, again, um, you, you don't want to happen. Um, and then there's actually four layers of extortion now because we're also seeing attackers uh, lay on top of that de uh, denial of service attacks uh, so you've got three different types of extortion with the data and then the denial of service attack. So sure. threats of the future definitely follow that model that it's around data. Mm. Um, but the other thing that really jumped out at me when I, when you're writing the paper, it's a weird process. So first you're immersed in the actual creation of the content and discussing, in my case, discussing with the co-author what should be in, what shouldn't be in, what, was, what were the implications, what's the meaning of this and so on. When that process is done, then you read the document looking for typos and punctuation errors and things that you might have forgotten to include that you really wanted to or mm. new things that may have occurred to you. And it's not until 
it's gone off to people to make it look pretty and put images in it and a, and a front cover on it and all that stuff that it comes back to you and really that's the first time that you can sit back and read it as a document mm. without looking for a typo or something so when i got that final copy and i was reading through it the thing that really jumped when i was thinking what did we write about here what's the underlying or overarching wherever you find it message of this document <laughs> And it turns out, I think, that it's all about truth, trust, and authenticity. And that that's going to be our greatest challenge for the next 10 years. How do we as individuals deal with the struggle to tell fact from fiction, um, reality from fantasy, and information from mis- or disinformation? Mm. Um, and how do we develop technical tools and procedures to help other people to make that distinction and I think over the next 10 years that's from a technology perspective and there's plenty of other challenges in the world but from a technology perspective that's one of our greatest challenges because today I don't really feel like that's an issue for me but it will be then you think so I think it's an issue for so many people today anyway for sure um, my parents for one <laughs> yeah and just look at the 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 birth growth and expansion of conspiracy theories you know we we mm. have people setting fire to or and or chopping down 5g tran uh, transceivers because brain cancer or something right mm. which is demonstrably false you have people making demonstrably false claims about vaccines not just the covid one but that you know there's mm. there's a couple of decades of history of anti-vax movement um and they are demonstrably false you can bring up you know, proper scientific academic content that says what you're saying is not true because here's a list of things. Mm. But these people can point to their own alternative facts and say, well, here's my list of things that say that your list is wrong. Mm. Um, and we don't have that, that critical thinking capability as a population mm. uh, to effectively do our own thinking. Our, you know, our thinking in many cases is dictated by influence operations of other people, states or organizations. You know, there, there are definite documented cases of astroturfing campaigns where p content published online has been done so with the express aim of changing people's opinions, views and behaviours and it's been successful. Um, For sure. You know, put us 10 years in the future, throw AI into the equation, throw deep fakes into the equation, think about something as simple as a, a business email compromise attack today, which is just around email. You know, I compromise an email account belonging to a senior exec within the business. I use that compromised account to send an email to someone in the finance department with an invoice mm. and some kind of social engineering that says, urgently pay this invoice, please. Move that 10 years in the future with, in the world of deep fakes and, and deep fake voices. Uh, and that could be a FaceTime conversation between you and your CEO, making sure that you pay an invoice on time. Mm. Um, so we need technical tools as well as the the emotional and critical acumen mm. to be able to, to make that distinction. We need technical tools that will be able to alert users in real time when they are interacting with artificially generated content or altered content. Mm. Uh, and we need to work out how we can do that and how we can target it effectively as well. Mm. Cool. Well, uh, I've been all over the place in my head during this uh, during this episode. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, reading that paper. Looking forward to reading for once in my life. I'm usually more of a <laughs> Good. See, I've achieved a goal. You have there achieved you go. a goal. You've, and I've been a shitty host because I haven't asked you anything or I haven't talked. I've just been listening to you. Actually, maybe or that's Or I've good been one. a shitty guest because I've just gone, nah, 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 nah. No, you're perfect. That's, that's why you're here. <laughs> but hey, is there anything, last question, is there anything in that document that actually makes you worried or is it like, you're not like, um, there, there is like hope there, right? You know, we just have to do some of the right things along the way. Or what's what's your uh, what was your feeling after you know? So the, the thing that, that one thing that, that sort of jumps out at me that, that I think we should pay more attention to and that is concerning today, but doesn't need to be concerning by twenty thirty. So that's kind of the, the plus side is that we you know we have, have time to rectify yeah. this kind of thing. We don't really pay much attention in our industry to ethics, and we never have within technology and cybersecurity. Ethics is not you don't find an expert in ethics usually working in our field mm. uh, and that will become increasingly hugely important and it's an area that if you are in not only technology development but technology deployment because very often you know you buy a technology and it's kind of vanilla when you get it out of the box and you 
configure it to suit your your requirements, particularly in, in the world of you know cloud and uh, and all the developments in cloud infrastructure. Um, we very definitely need to have a not just a consideration for ethics, but we need to begin to build ethics into what we do from a technology development perspective, from a deployment and configuration perspective, uh, and also from a, a first responder perspective. Because if you think about those fully fledged immersive digital environments that we're headed towards, um, those influence operations where you're having a fully fledged conversation with, a, with what looks like a real person mm. in real time, the consequences of cyber attacks will go beyond the digital 10 years from now. And they will definitely go into the psychological mm -hmm. for one and potentially into the physical for another, depending on the kind of attack that we're talking about. So we absolutely need to uh, have more of a consideration for ethics and we need to have more of an interface with um, physical safety and mental health care professionals. Mm. Uh, our industry can't afford just to stay where it is. And that's one of the the big lessons I think from an exercise like this. But do you think it's like the security people that need to have like an ethics person or just like the tech, the tech people? Cause it's not like, uh, I mean, it, the security it, people are kind of like the that, ethics today, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, but it's, it's an area that's going to be embedded all over. If you're developing something, then you will need ethics input into your development process. For sure, for sure. If you're allowing AI to make decisions, then you better have done a whole lot of ethical as well as technical testing of that AI to attempt as much as possible to eliminate human or learned biases from the AI that's doing the decision making. If you are working in a security operations center and you're responding to an incident, you will not be able to focus purely on the digital side of an incident 10 years from now, because happening at exactly the same time will be the psychological and the emotional side of the incident as well. So at the very least, you need to have developed this integration and interaction with people who will be able to respond to the human side of an attack Shit. while the digital side is also being taken care of. As if the SOC didn't have enough to do already. <laughs> enough pressure yeah. on them. Well, on, the, on the plus side, you know, 10 years from now in a SOC, all of the donkey work, all of the triage, that's taken care of by AI, right? We're already yeah, we heading so, in that direction. <laughs> tier, tier one SOC, you don't want a tier one SOC 10 years from now to be downgrading an alert that shouldn't have been at the status mm. it was or mm. finding duplicates. Right, you want your AI to be pulling all of that data in, presenting tier one uh, SOC analysts at minimum with a connected story mm. of events rather than a whole bunch of just a shower of events. And probably, actually, you want your AI to have taken first response actions and activities. So, tier one SOC analysts become people far more involved in um, policy setting and defining and explaining the event uh, the actions that have been taken by ai mm. rather than having to take action themselves right mm. contextualizing and explaining the actions that have already been taken at the speed of machine rather than hoping that a human saw the right alerts made the right um connections mm. between them and took the right action afterwards so it, it's great it doesn't put people out of work mm. it, it elevates the position of a tier one analyst yeah. to to a much greater degree and, and takes a lot of the repetitive and burnout inducing work out of those kinds of roles, which is cool. Well, that's a big change for eight years, Rick. That's the last time I saw you was eight years ago. Your hair is just as long still. <laughs> it, yeah, there's a whole story attached to hair, but we don't have time to tell that. <laughs> Not just as long, but it will be. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, very, very, very interesting stuff. And I mean that from uh, the bottom of my heart, actually, I have a lot of these things that you mentioned, like, uh, you know, we're always li li hearing about predictions and, but these are actual predictions that are like, you know, real world stuff that aren't like security predictions. They're, uh, and, and they're all, re they're all very realistic and they all have very, yeah, concerning sides to them. So uh, I'm glad that you were behind that, a real security person behind some of those predictions. And, and, but they, like I said, they have lots of positive sides too. And we, we talk about it in the white paper. It's not a full dystopia paper, you mm. know, the healthcare stuff, you know, we talk about the advantages that brings to people's lives, yeah, um, yeah. the educational stuff. It's, it's, it, it's not a dystopia paper, that's for sure, but we need to be aware. It's a paper about the natural evolution of, uh, of us as human beings, but some of the things that we should make sure we uh, look over along the way so we don't uh, screw up. Yep. Cool. Well, Mr. Ferguson, thank you for being nice to me eight years ago. Thanks thank you for being for, nice to me now. Uh, I appreciate me. it. <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks for inviting and me for, on. It's been And uh, for all the favors cool. you do for the security community. We'll see you around. Until next see time. You. Thank you. Ciao.